Thank you for staying with us on Citizen Weekend. On the governor's seat tonight, Wajir Governor Ahmed Abdullahi Mohammed. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you for having me, Lily. And let's address issues uh, relating to Wajir County. And let's begin with the fact that you have a budget de deficit of 900 million. How did that come to be? Uh, 918 million was the initial deficit that we had in our budget. Mm -hmm. It was a deficit that we thought through. Uh, we thought that, um, um, you know, we could partner with, um, say, uh, governmental agencies such as Prasatos that we know have specific programs in uh, Wajia County and um, that we could actually raise some money. Um, subsequent to the discussions that we had with the control of budgets requiring all counties to, you know, um, either explain or substantially reduce their deficits, um, we decided to reduce our deficit to two uh, amounts that we were sure of, the equalization fund of 268 million and about 347 million of conditional grants for ongoing projects that national government is um, currently undertaking. So um, that means that um, the um, deficit number that we have is now fully explained. Right. From the questions that we are getting, the comments that we are getting, a lot of people are of the opinion that Wajir County remains one of the poorest counties. And therefore, the question that people are addressing to you is what are your plans for the county, particularly in terms of water, health, and infrastructure? And I know that these are three independent issues that need to be looked at separately. But if you could just give the people of Wajir some information on what your priorities are currently. All right. Uh, Lillian, um, I do agree that Wajir County remains um, one of the you know, uh, poorest counties um, and I think that is a historical issue. Um, Wajir County also is unlucky to be the only one that, uh, or one of you I suppose, that does not have any overground water, no lakes, no rivers, um, so water is really um, a major issue. It's also very expensive, it's the third largest county in Kenya covering 60,000 square kilometers. Mm -hmm with uh, close to 600 settlements, um, you know, about 400 of which have no permanent source of water. Um, so um, in our budget this year, the things that we're focusing on mostly is water, uh, roads, and health, as you correctly said. Um, for water, we have a very ambitious target of um, uh, doing 100 boreholes. The borehole cover now is 105 over 60,000 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've already contracted National Water Corporation for the um, first 13. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that um, um, we can, you know, make a good attempt at that 100, which will, in a sense, double the borehole cover. Right. Uh, for health, we've put a lot of money into health in our budget. Uh, I think the uh, cover for nurses and health workers is very low. We only have one anesthetist in the entire county. Uh, that means... Um, you have one anesthetist, anesthetist in the entire county. The entire Any country. plans to make sure that this is corrected, that uh, this is addressed? This is a, a serious issue because uh, given that uh, the 60,000 square kilometers also does not have a single tarmac, a kilometer of tarmac uh, right. road. And, and we'll be talking about the road issue because that is one of the infrastructure challenges that the county is facing right, here. Right. And the diameter of the county is um, 500 kilometers from one point to the other. Uh, you can imagine that if there's a lady who has um, delivery, you know, complications in one end of the county and has to be brought to the um, headquarters, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, the chances of survival bec become um, very, very uh, small, really. So uh, we're putting a lot of money in our budget into employment of healthcare workers, right. uh, doctors, nurses, and all these specialists. Mm -hmm. um, we are also investing heavily in ambulances. Um, and um, mobile laboratory that can, you know, go around to the villages that do not have dispensaries and health centers. So good um, to know that yeah. health and water is, is, is being addressed right, currently. Right. You're looking to those issues. Uh, let's uh, touch on infrastructure before and, and, and um, the issue of the Garissa Mandera Highway, which passes through uh, Wajir. When will this road be tarmacked is a question that is, that is being asked, as well as the fact that, of course, you addressed that the challenge of the diameter being quite wide and the fact that people have to traverse long distances to access some of these services. services yeah. Yeah. Uh, the issue of um, you know, the Garissa to Mandera Road um, has been a recurrent uh, debate over the years. 
successive governments have always promised prior to the election that they will do that road as an emergency. Um, what I know now is that um, um, the bit between Garissa to a place called Nuno, uh, works have already begun. Um, and I know there are monies available at national government level for the uh, portion from Nuno to Madugash. Um, national government is still looking for monies for the portion from Madugash to Ajay, I suppose. Um, we will um, continue, uh, you know, uh, raising this issue mm -hmm. with national government. That's a national trunk road. Right. It does not um, squarely fall under the county government. Mm -hmm. But I think um, we, as the leadership of the entire region, uh, MPs, senators, and governors from the entire former northeastern province, uh, which is the three counties of Mandera, Garissa, and Wajia, are working together to see to it that you know we push the agenda of this road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The issue of porous borders and insecurity, another issue that is being raised, uh, Wajia borders Somalia to the east, and uh, there have been cases of frequent attacks from the Al Shabaab. Let's talk about what is done, what is being done to secure these borders currently. Right, uh, Wajia has two international borders. Uh, it borders Ethiopia to the north and uh, Somalia. Actually, I think it has the longest stretch of border with uh, Somalia mm -hmm. uh, in the um, east of the country. And um, yes, it is a porous border. We've had security challenges with respect to that border, um, especially, um, you know, um, on the Kismayu side. And um, um, again, it's something that we're working closely with national government to see to it um, that, uh, you know, uh, something is done. But we've also, um, you know, done sort of using the elder system and the clan elder system because the people on this side are ethnic Somalis. The ones on the other side are ethnic Somalis. Mm -hmm. They know which clans live on this side and which ones live on the other side. Um, through that elder system, we've tried to have arrangements to see to it that, you know, uh, people crossing over to our side, um, you know, uh, can be accounted for by our right. neighbors. Right. And we do the same. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, worked but it has been relatively peaceful, mm -hmm. but every so often, you know. It's uh, been relatively uh, peaceful, Mashimiwa, but there's the issue of, uh, the, ins of, of the Gari and the Degordia, uh, the politics that have led to uh, cases of insecurity and clashes. And the question, therefore, that begs is, is this a spillover from Mandera County, yeah. or is this an equally serious uh, issue in Wajir? The um, Gari and Degordia conflict was mostly a Mandera issue. Uh, because um, the population mix, the demographics mix is different uh -huh. between these two counties. Uh, but we border Mandera, and these two communities live together on, on, on either side. It's just that on the Mandera side, the um, population of the Degodias is much higher uh -huh. than it is for the Gares on this other side. Um, so we've had um, you know, a spillover that affected majorly um, two major towns, Burmayo and Gunana. And that's Bromeo is where my um, convoy was attacked on the peace mission. Um, I think with the help and intervention of um, um, both the national government and the leaders from, from the rest of Northeastern who do not come from those two clans um, and with religious leaders and everyone coming in. So there are peace um, building we, we, we have We have right. put that under control at the moment and we continue. Mm -hmm. to follow through to see to it that it does not happen again. And there's a question that, that, that has been raised here, not once, not twice. There's a problem with the way recruitment is being handled by making advertisements for positions, while at the same time the positions are shared on a round table between politicians who are your supporters and are fronting and qualified persons, as well as uh, comments here that um, you have fronted uh, persons um, affiliated to your clan for key positions. Your response to this? Um, I think that is more of a perception issue and I mean in politics you always have uh, supporters and opponents and um, the people who will always be opposed to you regardless of how you do things. I think in as far as um, stability of the county government is concerned, in as far as sharing of positions on an equitable basis is concerned, mm -hmm. um, Wajia um, is way, way, way ahead of um, a lot of the counties in the region um, and um, my um, cabinet of uh, 10 or so county executives um, has uh, people from the three main clans um, in the county as well as um, a minority uh -huh. and um, and I think even if you look at positions such as uh, who is governor who is senator who is deputy governor 
uh, for years is pretty much spread. Um, and um, there have been no, um, you know, uh, quarrels, um, uh, for lack of a better description, right. over right. positions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and Governor is still determined to press on with the issue of the referendum um, uh, on, on devolved funds. And uh, the question is, how do you plan to mobilize support with Jubilee-affiliated senators you pulled out of the referendum? Right. You are an ODM-affiliated, a court-affiliated governor. Mm. Your, your, your response to this, your views on the referendum issue, and how we got there in the first place? Uh, maybe beginning with how we got there in the first place. I think this had to do with the very... Um, uh, basic question of whether the functions that were devolved to these counties um, came with the attendant resources. Because the law is very clear. Um, the funds follow the functions. And the functions that are to be carried out by the, the counties are distinct. You know, they're in the fourth schedule of the Constitution, 14 or so functions. Um, what we realized as a result of the analysis of the budget is that for every three or so shillings that was meant for those devolved functions, one shilling was retained at national government level. Um, 103 billion out of a possible 313 that related specifically to devolved functions mm -hmm. was retained by national government ministries. And um, a lot of counties uh, you know, are, are struggling. That's why you see huge deficits. Uh, what people intended to do mm -hmm. um, is not you know, um, commensurate to the funds that they've been given. The funds are much uh, less. So, um, and then we also realized that there were certain um, words in, 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 in the Constitution that made it harder for us to get equitable um, share that's based on current revenues. Uh, the debate as to whether it's 50, you know, 32 percent or 14.6 percent that has been given to the county governments is as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Because um, the law says that um, uh, at least 15 percent of the last audited and approved revenues of government should be given to county governments. Uh, the, right. last, uh -huh. the last audited and approved revenues as of now is 2010-2011. Right. So on that basis, we have 32%. Mm -hmm. But you will um, um, reckon that there is 2011-2012, which has been audited by the Auditor General, but has not been approved by Parliament, and that's out of our hands. Mm -hmm. and then and there's and also 2012-2013, which is yet to be audited. And as we wind up, you did yeah. pull out of the referendum. Uh, just your views as we wind up on why you felt that it was necessary to pull out? Uh, I, I, I did not pull out of the referendum. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether that <laughs> where that impression is coming. I support the referendum in principle as long as it sticks to those three issues, mm -hmm. which is you know protecting uh, the Senate from the National Assembly so that the Senate can be a better protector. So you have your of, issues of, with of some of the elements surrounding why there is a push for the referendum? Um, I am in support of the referendum okay. consensus position that was taken mm -hmm. um, you know, unanimously by the um, Council of Governors. Okay. The other issues around um, how we elect the president and all that, that came later, which I know the people who are pushing have also uh, sort of backtracked on, I'm not in support of that. Okay. But the initial position, mm -hmm. which remains to be the position of the Council of Governors, that we are pushing for this referendum to address those issues. But we welcome debate as to alternative ways of addressing these issues. Mm -hmm. I think saying that governors should first use uh, what they've been given does not solve the issue. That brings in an element of tokenism, which takes us back to where we were before the, before the constitution. Yeah. All right, and thank you very much for your views. Ahmed Abdullahi Mohammed, uh, Governor Wajir County, he has addressed your questions in terms of development and what his priorities are. He has touched on the fact that water, health, and infrastructure are the key priorities that he is looking into as we speak, hoping that, of course, um, Wajir County will stop to lag behind in as far as development is concerned okay. before the your five years are up. Thank you very much for your time. Thank this you. Evening. Thank you. Lady. Thank you. Thank you. Please remain seated, sir. Um, and let's move on now to the strength of a woman. And fishing in Kenya has traditionally been associated with men. Rarely do you spot a woman braving the early morning cold to go fishing. But Ruth Agong has been in this male-dominated business of fishing in Lake Victoria for three years now and has earned the respect of her male colleagues and indeed from the rest of the community. Tonight on Strength of a Woman, we, fisher, we feature... <laughs> The fisherwoman of Lake Victoria. Let's take a look. <laughs> 